We are obsessed, curious, distracted, and fixated. Like an accident on the side of the road, we can't look away. Something or someone has our attention. We are followers, and we are all following something. Sports teams, political candidates, natural disasters, breaking news, financial markets, technology trends, famous people. The list never ends. What is your curious obsession? Who or what are you following? Is Jesus on your list? Does he turn in and out of your thoughts? Is he a consideration of who you are and what you do? He should be. Let your heart catch fire with what it means to be a Jesus father. Your life will never be the same. Well, so glad you made it to Lord's house and survived the Flizzard 2022. Glad you made it. It's a little chilly outside, that is for sure. And so glad you're here. Those of you joining online, we're so glad you're here. COVID is uh, our good friend. It's rolling around. Got a lot of folks that are out with that. Uh, Justin is out with that today, would be here today, but he's out with uh, COVID. So a lot of folks we want to be praying for in that regard. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn to Matthew chapter 11? Matthew chapter 11. We begin a brand new series. I'm so excited about this brand new series we begin today, The Life of a Jesus follower. By the way, if you did not get to come to a life group this morning, we're going to have breakfast again at 8.30 next Sunday morning because we want to get you here at 9 o'clock for a life group. So there's workbooks right back here. Books, not workbooks because that's not, it sounds like work. It's not work. It's a devotional book, all right? It's in the back back here. They're $5. You need to be a part of a life group. If you're not part of one, we want to get you in one next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. If you're watching online with us, we'd love to get a book to you, and you want to say, I want to be a part of a group, we'd love to do a Zoom group. If you want to do that, if you'll reach out to us in the chat right now, we've got some folks monitoring that, or you can email me at brad at and we'll get you connected to an online group if you want to be a part of one of those as well. But this is critical to help you get the most out of this series and what we're going to be doing together. I just want to ask a question this morning to all of us. And it's a question that when you hear it, you're going to be like, well, that's a really dumb question. But I want to ask it of you this morning. Here it is. How many of us desire, how many of us desire to faithfully follow Jesus? On your outline this morning, it says the question, how or do you desire to be a faithful follower of Jesus? Now, if I ask that question, I think most of us in the room would answer yes. I don't think any of us would say, well, preacher, my goal in life is to be a half-hearted follower of Jesus. I I want to just kind of do it as minimalistic as I possibly can. That's kind of my goal uh, in my life. I really don't want to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. But the real question, if the answer to that question is yes, that we want to be a follower, a fully committed, a faithful follower of Jesus, then the question we have to ask ourselves next myself included, is why don't we? Why don't we live that life? Why do we sometimes half-heartedly follow Jesus with our lives? And maybe for some of us, there's all kinds of reasons, but for some of us, maybe we really don't have that solid understanding of what it means to follow Jesus with our whole heart. With everything that we are, with all that we can give to the Lord, that He is the first priority. As we talked about two Sundays ago, that He is God first in everything that we do. So the hope and the point of our series over these next several weeks together is to talk about what does it look like to faithfully follow Jesus. And I want to tell you something. I believe this is so true. I believe it is so simple that we miss it. I believe it is so joy-filled that we'll desire it. That we won't want any longer of a half-hearted faith, of a half-hearted following of Jesus. But we'll desire, we'll seek after this wholehearted following of Jesus in our life. But it leads us to the second question. I've asked you the first question on your outline this morning. Do you desire to faithfully follow Jesus? The second question is, what does a faithful follower of Jesus look like? What does a faithful follower of Jesus look like? Really, I'm asking this question, what kind of target are you shooting at? 
Back in the 2004 Olympics in Athens, there was a USA uh, guy that was shooting uh, the rifle at the targets there. It was one of uh, the Olympic sports there. He was a gold medal finalist. He was absolutely blowing the competition away. It came down to the last round of the, of the sharp shooting there, to whatever distance it was. And they were getting ready. And he gets ready. They're, they're aimed in. You remember, the, you remember the, the videos of it? They'll have a picture of that target. Everybody hears the gun go off, but the target is blank. And the guy is incredulous because he's like, I know I hit a bullseye. And as they began to look around and they began, the judges began to confer, you see what had happened is the guy had zeroed in on the target next to his target. He hit the wrong target. And as a result, he got a zero on that score. Not only not score a gold medal, in fact, he didn't even medal at all. You see, we got to know what the target is we're shooting at. What does it look like to faithfully follow Jesus? Well, in today's culture, really quite frankly, there's two things, maybe in church culture, that would talk about what does it, how do we define a follower of Jesus? How do you define that? What does that look like for you? And really, two targets that might, you might be shooting at, that a lot of people shoot at, that might define what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Number one on your outline is this, is that people define it by what a person does. By what a person does, by the activity of their life. That they intend church, you read the Bible, you pray, you give, you share the gospel. You're a good father, daughter, son, mother. You're a good husband or wife. You work hard at your job. You don't break the Ten Commandments. You avoid the things you're not supposed to do. And as we can easily, all of us drift towards this target because honestly it seems easy and simple in some days to do the right things and just don't do the wrong things. Now let me be clear, those list of things I just mentioned, there's nothing wrong with those in and of themselves. They are needed and they are necessary and they are a part of a follower, uh, living a life of a follower of Jesus. But it is a false idea if we think that it earns God's love or approval or gives us some kind of spiritual credit in God's heavenly bank and trust. You see, the target of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is not just what you do. The second one people often would say is by what a person knows. By information. Well, a faithful follower of Jesus, not only maybe it's not just what they do, but it's what they know. It's the information they've gathered. It's all the spiritual information, doctrine and theology. All about going to Bible study, studying Bible for a couple of hours a day, learning to memorize things, learning all the right theological questions. And again, nothing wrong with that. Essential doctrine is very important. Theology is an essential element of your faith. We need to know what we believe and why we believe it to be true. But the problem is, if we ever elevate knowing more about Jesus than actually knowing Jesus, we have a problem. Let let me say that again. If we elevate knowing about Jesus more than we know Jesus, then we have a problem. So often people will define what it means to follow Jesus faithfully as it's what I do and it's, it's what I know. And if we're not careful, our attempts at, at following Jesus, if we're on those two roads, can leave us sometimes feeling burdened, overwhelmed. I just don't measure up. I just can't quite get there. But that's the opposite of what Jesus described to his disciples of what it means to follow him. Look with me, if you will, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. And Jesus says these powerful words to his disciples. Here's what he says. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you shall find rest for your souls. Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my load is light. You see, what if we focus on these two targets of, of what does it mean to follow Jesus? We look at this definition that leaves us where it says being unburdened, one that's a place of rest, one that is easy, one that is light. We're like, what is the difference? The one that Jesus was offering to take away was religion. Religion is all about what I do and it's all about what I know. It's just checking things off our chart, if you will. 
But the reality is, for many of us, if we're not careful, that superficial system of what I do and what I know versus an authentic relationship with Jesus can seem a little bit easier because it's something I can control. It's something that I can do. But here's the powerful truth I want you to hear today. As we jump into this series, here it is. The Christian life isn't me living for Jesus, but Jesus living his life in and through me. The Christian life isn't me living for Jesus, but instead it's Jesus living his life in and through me. That is the key. And it's not just some nuance and play on words. This is really, really true. For what it means to follow Jesus, as we look at the life of Jesus, what did it mean for him to walk and live out in front of his disciples? He was a master, a rabbi, a teacher, and what was he emulating? What was he modeling to his disciples? It really boiled down to one word. If you read through the Gospels, you'll see this one word. It is the word relationships. Following Jesus is all about relationships. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, Jesus talks about, through the apostle Paul, what it means to follow Jesus. I want you to listen to these words. It's so important. What does it say here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3? But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Let me ask you another question. How would you define or describe your relationship with Jesus Christ? Is it one that is simple and is it pure? Well, that's a powerful question. Paul says Christ has come to set us free from religion, from the attempts to earn God's favor. That's what every other religion in the world does, is trying to earn some God's favor. But the incredible news is, friend, is I don't have to earn God's favor. In fact, I can't earn God's favor. I can only receive it. It's so simple, and it is so pure. Pursuing the life of a Jesus follower is about pursuing the same relationships he pursued, pure and simple. Three relationships that Jesus pursued while he was here on this earth. Number one, notice this, following Jesus is all about a relationship with God. Following Jesus is all about a relationship with God, with the heavenly Father. The Gospels are filled with stories and moments in the life of Jesus when we, the relationship between Father and Son is talked about. Jesus showed us over and over and over what it meant to live moment by moment in total dependence on the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. We read about the Father being pleased with His Son at the moment of baptism. We read of Jesus arising early in Mark chapter 1, verse 35 to commune with His heavenly Father. We read in John 17 a moment of of intimate prayer and and of agonizing prayer between the Father and the Son. You see, Jesus prioritized spending time with the Father over everything else. Everything he did and accomplished was because the Father was at work in and through him. In John chapter 14, verse 10 through 11, we see this truth. Jesus said these words, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. You see, the key word in Jesus' life and his relationship with the Father is the word abide. We find it in the word abide. The word means to be at home with, to dwell with, to to be at rest with. John 15 verse 4 to 5 echoes this word about abide. 
Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do, watch this, what? Nothing. I want to come back to that word in just a moment, but I want to talk about this word abide for just a moment. The word abide means to live in him, to be in fellowship with him, this wonderful, intimate relationship with the Father, to receive from him, to be at home with him. Let me ask you yet another question. Are you abiding in Christ Jesus? Is your relationship one of intimacy, one of authenticity, one of simplicity, one of purity? You see, the invitation we're talking about in these next eight weeks together is an invitation to follow Jesus, isn't just to live for Jesus, but it's an invitation to abide in Jesus and let him, out of the overflow of our relationship with him, let him live his life in and through us in a way that will produce fruit for the kingdom. He talks about abiding here, the, the, we are the, that he is the vine, we're the branches, we're connected to the vine. It's a beautiful image that they would get. I have to imagine that Jesus was, was referencing a vine when he was talking to them. And I'm the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches, and I will give you what you need. I will flow in and through you. And then he says these powerful words in John chapter 15. 5 verse 19 and in John 8 28 through 29 do we have those I don't know if we if I put those in there or not these these two verses talk about this word here it is apart from me you can do nothing if Jesus said he could do nothing apart from the father why do we think that we can do anything apart from the father now, we don't ever think to ourselves, well, I'm going to do this. I don't need Jesus' help. We don't really say that out loud. But sometimes that's how we act. That's sometimes that's how we are in our relationship with the Father is we think it's all about what I do instead of abiding in Him. Jesus said, you and I can do nothing apart from the Father. Now, the reality is my identity in Christ as a believer isn't found in my performance but instead in my position in Christ as a love accepted child of the Father, enjoying a relationship with Him. Secondly, not only do you have a relationship with the Father, the second relationship He had in the Gospels we see so clearly, following Jesus is about having relationships with other believers. Following Jesus is about a relationship with other believers. Jesus invited his disciples to be in relationship not only with him by calling out their old lives so they could join him in this kingdom activity, but also so they could be in relationship with others. John 1.43 talks about this relationship. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip and, 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 and he found Philip and Jesus said to him, follow me. We see it other places in the gospels. He tells the disciples, come be in relationship with me. Come and follow me. Jesus prayed with them, taught them, challenged them, walked with them. They saw Jesus in every single moment of his life. The good, the bad, the ups and the down moments of life. And Jesus was constantly pouring into them, using everyday moments to teach them what it meant to follow him. To show them who he was and how he wanted them to live their life. And what it meant to be in a relationship with him. He shows them in different places, different things in Mark chapter 6. Uh, verses 33 to 52, he talks about feeding the 5,000, explains him what that means. Then he calms the storm and comforts the disciples. You see, Jesus lived in an intimate personal relationship with the Father that then spilled over into the connecting relationships, the intentional relationships of fellowship with them. You see, the key word here is the word connect. Now, if you didn't remember back from our vision 2022 last week, the key word of 2022 is the word connect. We want people to be connected. Here is the critical piece of that. Connection is critical. We cannot be who Christ called us to be without being connected. God made us to be connected. Friend, we look all the way back in the beginning in Genesis. 
In chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be what? Alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. In other words, he created them to be connected. We then jump all the way forward into the early church and see these relationships on display in the book of Acts in chapter 2. Look at what was happening. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Listen, this is why we have large group gatherings. Talk about what they were doing in the early church. They had small group gatherings from house to house for mutual moments of caring, fellowship, worshiping together, sharing life together, the highs, the lows, the good, the bad. It's about being in relationship with one another. Jesus said in John 15, verse 12, this is my commandment, what? That you love one another just as I have loved you. You see, he starts with the fact that how we love other people, we only know how to love other people as we learn how to love the Father and how he's loved us. And as we learn how he's loved us, then our natural response is that we want to love others, that we love one another, not just in word, but in deed, loving people the way that Jesus loved us. Jesus demonstrated it. He poured out his life for his friends. It's so crucial that you and I are connected, deeply connected, to other followers of Jesus. In fact, here is the truth. One of the evidences of the fact that you are a follower of Jesus is that, and that you're walking in fellowship with Christ Jesus is that you have a connecting relationship with other brothers and sisters in Christ. So the first relationship is the relationship Christ had with the Father. The second one was what he had with other believers. Thirdly. The third and most important or the important relationship is the relationships he had with those in the world. Following Jesus is about a relationship with the world. Jesus spent time with lost people, with sick people, with hurting people, with needy people, with broken people. And even those who thought they had their lives together. Jesus spent time with people. In fact, he sought them out. One of the key patterns in the Gospels is that we see Jesus seeking out people. Building intentional, engaging, loving relationships with people who were lost. Who were far away from God. And even some that thought they were close but didn't realize how really far away they were. So that they could come to know God through him. Listen, we see Jesus. You can find these all throughout the Gospels. These moments, these relational encounters where Jesus seeks out. And even sometimes they sought him out. I think about Nicodemus in John chapter 3. One of my favorite stories where Nicodemus, a religious leader who has everything to lose. Everything to lose. Seeks out Jesus. He has questions. He has things he doesn't quite understand. I want to show you a video clip that happened a couple of weeks ago of a modern day, perhaps Nicodemus. Some of you may know the name, Elon Musk. Anybody know that name? Anybody, anybody aware of that guy's name? Yeah, my, my son, my older son's infatuated with that guy everywhere we drive. Tesla, Tesla, Tesla. He's one of those guys that people recognize the name. You don't know him. He's the creator of Tesla. He's one of the, uh, one of the sp- SpaceX. Is that what he does? I don't know which one he does. He does one of the space. SpaceX is it, right? This guy is like the top five or ten technology names in the world today. There is a, uh, a satirical website called the Babylon D. Some of you may have seen this before. And uh, it's a funny satirical look that reminds us things about the church. And for some reason, Elon Musk followed this particular 
group on Twitter. He agreed to an hour and a half interview. He has not agreed to an interview with CNN, with Fox News, with no other major news outlet, but he agrees to an hour and a half interview with the Babylon Bee. They interview him for an hour and a half about all kinds of things, and then they end with this. Take a look. We're wondering if you can do us a quick solid and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Yeah. We're wondering if you could do us a quick solid and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Yeah. On Real the quick. show. <laughs> um, personal Lord and Savior. It's a quick prayer. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I mean, let's just say, like, I agree with the principles that Jesus advocated, um, and th that the you know there's some some there's great wisdom in what in, in the te teachings of of Jesus, uh, and I agree with those teachings. Um, and things like turn the other cheek are are very important because as opposed to an eye for an eye. Um, an eye for an eye leads everyone blind. So forgiveness, you know, is important and um, treating people as you would wish to be treated. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Very important. So it's like a 60, 70% as, yes? <laughs> as Einstein would say, I believe in the God of Spinoza. Um, so, um, but hey, if, um, you know, if, if, if Jesus is, is uh, saving people, I mean, I'll, I'll, I won't stand in his way, you know, I'll, I'll be fair, I'll be fair, why not? Sweet, we did it. Yeah. I think he just said yes. We got him. <laughs> All right. We got him. We got him. We got him. to be saved. Sounds good. Do you want to get baptized or anything? Yeah. Yeah. I was baptized. Oh, oh okay. Anglican. Yeah. Anglican. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's done. Yeah. They, they, got, they got him in the water when it's just a baby. Cool. I'm not going to stand in the way of Jesus as if you could. He said he worshiped. You see what he said? I agree with the teachings of Jesus. How many people are out there like him that know about Jesus? They've heard of Jesus. He's so close. He's so close. But yet he says he believes in the God of Spinoza. Now, if you want to go Google that one right there, that's a philosophical guy who wrote some things back several centuries ago that basically everything is God. But Jesus sought out people, even an Elon Musk. Who is the Elon Musk in your world? Who is the person that knows about the Lord, has heard about the Lord? Maybe, that, maybe they've never heard about the Lord. But even he knows about the stories of the Bible. Jesus sought out Nicodemus in John chapter 4. Jesus seeks out the woman at the well. Not a woman with a great reputation. She had had five husbands and was living with number six. He seeks out Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus, the hated tax collector, he found an IRS agent and shared the gospel with him. And Zacchaeus and the woman at the well and Nicodemus' life were forever changed. And Nicodemus wasn't changed right away. We go to John chapter 3 and we see that he doesn't find Christ at that moment. He heard. We don't see until Christ is crucified that somewhere in that juncture, and he stepped over the line and said yes to Jesus. The key word here is the word share. We use the words abide, connect. The third word is the word share. We're called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. The greatest news, the most unbelievable news. <laughs> The gospel that Jesus has come to give light, to bring us into a right relationship with the Father, to give us peace and joy and purpose and hope, and so much more right here and then in this life to come. In John chapter 17, verse 18, Jesus tells his disciples, as you sent me into the world, or Jesus saying this to the Father, I have also sent them into the world. We are that them. 
We are called to be Christ ambassadors that represent him to a lost and dying world. And by the way, he didn't ask you or me if I wanted to be or was I willing to be. He simply said, you are my ambassadors. You are my representatives. You are my witnesses. The only question is, what kind are we? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 20 says these words. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, sharing the good news of Christ. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us. You, follower of Jesus, are the us. The word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. Listen to Paul's words. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Listen, missions and evangelism isn't what we do as Jesus followers. Being on mission is who we are as Jesus followers. And here's one of the truths that this series has slammed in my face and reminded me of this truth. And you'll hear Vance Pittman share this in your life group and in this devotional book. And here's what he says. If you and I don't love other believers as Christ loved us in that same way, and we're not deeply connected, and if we're not deeply burdened over those that don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, and we're not deeply called and hearing the call to share, then our problem is not that we don't love lost people. It's not that we don't love other believers. The problem is, listen to, listen to what he says, the problem is I don't love Jesus enough. Jesus is not my first love. I'm not passionately loving and in that relationship with him. Because if I am, here's the truth. And it's a hard truth, but it's the truth. That if I'm loving Christ, then I will love who he loves. And he loves the bride of Christ. And he also loves those who are far from him and that are far from him. And he's saying to us, I'm begging you. You are my ambassadors. You and I have the word of truth. Elon Musk doesn't yet understand it. And there are people in your cubicle and in your third period class and down the hallway from you in your office and down the street from you and maybe in your own family who've yet to understand the calling of a gracious God. You see, our calling is not to have a great career, to have a comfortable retirement, be popular, famous, or be comfortable living on easy street. Our call is to be living for eternity. I read this two days ago on Twitter, and it came to home yesterday in some major ways, but he said this, he said this statement that 165,000 people will die around our world. And many of them have no idea that there'll be that number tomorrow. See, our call is to live for that which is to come, not just for today. And Satan would love to have us confused by his craftiness to think that this world is so important and all this stuff that we worry about. And yet it comes down to three relationships. A relationship with the Father, and I'm abiding in Him. A relationship with other believers where I'm connecting with them. And thirdly, a relationship with a lost and dying world that I'm sharing the good news of Christ. Final thought. All three of these relationships are completely interdependent. You got to have all three in your life. Not just one or the other, but all three. Look what it says in John 13, 34 to 35 as we wrap up. As a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another.
It's out of that overflow of the relationship we have with the Father that we then have a relationship with others around us, with those who have yet to hear the good news. It gives us our greatest platform to have an authentic gospel witness to a lost and dying world because we love the Father and we love each other and we love them. And number two, we follow Jesus as we invest in the relationships that he invested in. It's honestly as simple and pure as that. It's really not that complicated. Dear friend, are you trying to live for Jesus? Are you allowing the Jesus to live in and through you? What target are you shooting at this morning? Are you shooting the target about what it is that you do or what it is that you know? I want to encourage you this morning as we come to a time of invitation, you consider some things. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment as we come to a time of response and invitation. So important. I want to ask you to just to hang tight. Don't move anywhere. Just want you to hear the word of the Lord this morning for you and for me. Today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Do you have that relationship with the Lord? Are you stuck in religion? Or are you in a relationship with the Lord? Today, He invites you into that relationship with Him. You can do that today. If you're watching online this morning, I want you to know there's something this morning. You can do that today. You can reach out to us. We have folks monitoring the chat right now. And you can say, ah, I need to know Jesus. I've missed the target. Maybe you're in the building this morning and you would be honest enough to say, I've never, ever trusted Christ as my Savior and Lord. And I'm tired. It feels like a burden. I've never been unburdened. It's never seemed simple or pure to me. But today I invite you, friend, to admit to God that you're a sinner, to ask Him to forgive you of all of your sins, to believe the gospel is true. Not just believe in the stories of the Bible, believe in Jesus and what he said was true. And dear friend, Elon Musk or no one else on heaven or earth can keep you from coming to Jesus Christ today. You simply have to come and believe. Confess him as your savior and commit your life to him as Lord. Maybe today you're tired and you're stuck in a rut. You're not faithfully following Jesus. Maybe you've been going all about it the wrong way. And maybe today, as we've talked about this morning, that you want to be back in that relationship to allow him to, for you to abide in him, to give you that fresh joy and simplicity in following him. Maybe for others, you need to work on that second relationship to be a part of the body of Christ. You're missing that second relationship. Maybe you're not a part of joining this church family this morning. Maybe you need to get in a life group this morning. Maybe you've been disconnected. You need to get reconnected this morning to be known and to know others, to, to love others and let them love on you. Maybe some of you this morning are watching online. You brought a huge burden. It's overwhelming you today. And you need to hear the invitation of a God through his son Jesus who says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Some of you need rest this morning. And dear friends, his arms are open wide waiting for you. Maybe the last you're not investing in that relationship with him, with those that are lost and need to know Christ. And again, the problem is not that we don't love lost people enough as we're not really loving Jesus enough, just to be honest. When you're not deeply passionate and burdened by those who don't know him. May today, God may call you afresh and anew to hear that call, to share the greatest news the world has ever Lord, I pray this morning as we come to a time to respond to you through worship, through response, physically, Lord, of what you're doing in our heart privately, whether it's on an online chat or an email later on or to come to this altar and do business with you or maybe it's to come and grab me by the hand and say, I need to join this church family. I need to find Christ as my Savior and Lord. I need to, to commit my life to full-time Christian ministry. Maybe just a burden on your heart. You need someone to pray with you. You can grab a friend and come to the altar. You can pray right there in your seat. 
But Father, I pray right now in these moments we would do exactly what you've called us to do. And God, I thank you that the Christian life is not about me living for you, but it's about you living in and through me. It is yet not I, but Christ in me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.